Hello all, I'm Mudassir and we are here at Kavita Krishna and I'm sure many of you know, know her very well. She is Secretary of All India Progressive Women's Association and she's also a member of this Politburo member. Politburo member of Communist Party of India. Marxist Leninist, yes. Yeah. And I'm sure most of the guys yeah. know you already. Okay. So, actually, she's here in London and it's very great to see her. Uh, and uh, well, I, I request her essentially to have a chat mm -hmm. with regard to Kashmir in particular. So uh, to begin with obviously yeah. and, uh, and thanks for actually yeah. agreeing to have a chat. Okay. And, um, uh, we are going to talk about Kashmir obviously yeah. and we are going to then talk about India as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start with this yeah. recent constitutional change with regard to Kashmir. Yes. And since the day uh, this agreement between Kashmir and India was actually broken, mm -hmm. we see many Indians actually arguing that this has been done for the good of Kashmiris themselves. Yes. They also argue, argue that the restrictions as mm -hmm. of now, mm -hmm. they may sound painful, but in the end they are going to benefit Kashmiris. Right. How do you see this? Um, I have seen these arguments, um, not just from sort of random uh, people, but also, um, and not only from those who are supporting the Modi government, but even from some liberal quarters like the journalist uh, Barkhadat and so on. They've written similar things. And I think that there's a uh, very fundamental way in which this kind of argument is wrong. And the reason is because uh, this has been, this is a familiar script. It has been used by totalitarian regimes and colonial uh, powers and all of that. Every time, you know, even the emergency was imposed in India in 1975, uh, saying, 74, saying that um, it's good for people and trains will run on time and this and that, you know. So this kind of idea of the uh, paternalistic uh, you know, state having the power to decide things for you and uh, people are kind of uh, subjects and they don't have a right to decide. This is a more general thing of course in India whereby the government takes decisions like demonetization and so on without consulting a soul. But in the case of Kashmir there is an added dimension of a sort of colonial mentality where the idea is that Kashmiris in particular are incapable of, uh, you know, uh, there's something wrong with them. They need to be, they need strong discipline. So it's not, you know, so where Kashmiris are concerned, the analogy is with children. So it's almost as though, oh, these are kind of badly behaved children and we need to set it all right and make them behave, you know, that kind of uh, thinking, which I think is, of course, morally, ethically, politically, in every way it is wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's actually, it's good to see actually the deep, fundamentals going yeah, yeah. under this, this sort of operation. Mm -hmm. A related question came to my mind and it's actually from, coming from my experience as well. Mm -hmm. So we have these Indian friends here as mm -hmm. well as non-Indian friends. Mm -hmm. As non-Indian friends by and large they have been supportive and they feel our pain. Mm -hmm. But the Indians they haven't been able to feel this pain. I was like do you think the operation of Kashmiri by Indian state has dehumanized Indian populace as such because they are not able to have this empathy for fellow Kashmiri human beings? See, I think that, um, you know, to understand this a little better and to contextualize it a little, uh, I want to say here that, you know, um, obviously there's a larger problem here where um, there are so many narratives in which, you know, for instance, caste oppression, there is a, uh, there is a strong narrative that denies the existence of caste oppression, yes. that denies the existence of gender oppression, you know, that denies the existence of communal violence in India or, or rationalizes it. Uh, so I think there are very powerful propaganda mechanism that's happening, especially now by the Indian television media in particular, which is trying to desensitize um, Indian, Indian, uh, Indian people, of course. For instance, I remember that in 2016, when the, uh, you know, the pellet guns were used very widely, I remember that there were a lot of very, very absolutely kind of, you know, ordinary people in India who had reached out to say, you're speaking about this and we are feeling terrible, we can't sleep at night thinking that this is happening in our name and this is bad. After that, I noticed that the uh, media channels, they kind of upped up, uh, you know, they, they hiked up their propaganda, targeting um, not just militants and so on, but targeting stone pelters. And in the name of stone pelters, they targeted civilians. Mm -hmm. So the Indian army also started speaking out about saying that if civilians are blocking our encounters and so on, then we will uh, treat them like terrorists and we will eliminate them and all of that. So the, you know, there's, so there's this whole thing about trying to uh, do away with any distinctions at all, even among, uh, you know, even among the actions of, 
you know, Kashmiri Christians. So basically, you know, that's one thing. But, but having said that, I want to say that there's a lot of things that don't show up on social media and media. In my experience, um, there's a dual thing happening now, whereby after 5th August, I'm seeing a whole lot of people who perhaps before 5th August may not have been able to recognize what was happening in Kashmir. No. But after 5th August, they have. And they are beginning to ask, you know, what is this happening? And they're beginning to make connections with their situation. For instance, um, a lot of portals that carried uh, videos, of course, mainstream media was not carrying a thing, right? But after 5th August, after 7th, um, and I, even after I returned from our Kashmir visit, a lot of small portals which are basically serving, you know, they, they think of themselves as being Dalit Bahujan um, or minority oriented uh, little little YouTube uh, channels yeah. and portals and so on. They carried, um, a whole, and I'm not talking about well-known portals like Wire or so on, I'm talking about small, like small. little ones. They went, you know, they did little videos that went viral and they were making the connection by saying that, look, if Article 370 is seen as being temporary by the BJP, so is SCST reservation seen as being temporary. So is the Indian constitution itself seen as being, you know, kind of, Something. you just have to pay lip service to it, but you can just mangle it as and when, right? So I think, um, and also there were other connections, for instance, even prior to 5th August, I'll, I'll share with you. For instance, wherever, uh, in 2016, I remember that we called Natasha Rathra from, uh, you know, one of the authors of the, do you know, uh, do you remember Kunal 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 book? So we called her to an IPOA national conference, uh, my organization's national conference to speak. And she came and she was addressing an audience in Patna, many of whom were women from Bihar or even from Andhra and so on. Now these are, you know, women from oppressed communities uh, who have a collective memory of um, terrible repression in the name of curbing Naxalism and so on right there, okay? So they, um, you know, they have faced the Ranveer Sena and all of that. So for them, listening about Ikhwans or listening about, uh, you know, listening about night raids, you know, uh, so in, if, you, if you speak to someone who is from a different class, what happens is their first, in, in how an army couldn't possibly do that? There's a disbelief. Whereas among those who actually face this kind of yes, repression, right. There is no disbelief. They are immediately empathizing with, and then the only, um, you know, the only leap is to understand why there's a different context of why it is happening in Kashmir. If it is happening in India because you are against the Indian state, in Kashmir it is also happening because you do not want uh, the Kashmiri people. Uh, you are saying that certain political opinions in Kashmir are completely taboo, and we must prevent. Uh, the truth from being known that Kashmiri people are wanting to have a say in deciding what happens to them in the future. You know, so I think uh, something as simple as that, whereby it's a basic democratic tenet, right, mm -hmm. that people should have a right to, uh, you know, have a say in well, their own, how their own lives and their, how they are governed and how their own lives are run. And that is really the fundamental thing. And uh, there's an attempt to kind of block off empathy for that. In spite of that, because this time around, I'm seeing a lot of opening up, a lot of people wanting to know, wanting to read, uh, and asking for information. So you know? That's actually at least a yeah. good thing, yeah, particularly yeah. for people yeah. sitting far from India. Yeah. We, we, we yeah. are a bit, yeah. uh, I would say, less optimistic, but it's good to know yeah. about that. Yeah. So going back to actually this uh, versus Kashmir, they are not able to take decisions for themselves, mm -hmm. and we need to take these decisions for them. Yeah. Do you say it's a sort of racism? And if so, yeah. Why did it take only 70 years to embed in Indian psyche when we compare it with, let's say, color racism or, uh, or patriarchy as such, which took ages to actually embed in the knowledge? Yeah, no, I don't think it's only 70 years and all of that. It is, I think, a larger, it's a longer process. And it's yeah. not, as I said, you know, I think the Indian state's uh, approach in these matters, um, there's a need to also draw connections. It's not just Kashmir, you know, they have flexed this kind of, mental muscle in other places right and well, they have, for instance the way adivasis are treated okay? so the idea is that you know oh you know they can be trotted out as being exotic uh, you know their art forms and yeah. so on but the fact that they have uh, certain rights that they have fought for and won this is something you know so in a republic day parade all right but if they are out there demanding land and jungle jam mm -hmm. jameen, mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, let's shoot them, right? Shoot them. And uh, there is an active, so if you visit Chhattisgarh, if you visit, um, you know, so there's a heavy militarization there. And the rationale for militarization is that these are innocent people who are misled by certain Some, political. So uh, just uh, similarly in Kashmir, they'll say, oh, it's all a Pakistani agenda. agenda. So the idea that Kashmiris themselves have um, uh, a capacity uh, and uh, th this is a highly educated, highly um, well-informed uh, people 
you go to Kashmir and every child will school you on Kashmir Kashmir. history, okay? And give you a nice tight scolding if you don't know the basics. Um, This is something which, uh, you know, so clearly these are not people that you can treat as, oh, you know, they don't know what they're doing. Of course they know what they're doing. They know what they want. And they have differences among them as well, just like in any alive political community, you know, where there will be people with different ideas about what should be done, different political positions. So to conflate everything and say, oh, they are. So and what Modi is trying to do is a new thing which is also to, to simply say that Kashmiris are anti-India, anti-national because they um, are Muslim. And Muslims, as we know, in Modi speak, in BJP speak, are basically all pro-Pakistan, their hearts are with Pakistan, all of that. And so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, there's a difference in the way in which Modi's strategy, um, uh, you know, of Kashmir. And that, that's also something we need to engage with. So I hope you'll ask me about that as well. Like, yeah, I'm yeah. going to add uh, uh, yeah. get your point. It seems like it's something pan-Indian in the sense because when they see any community which sort of rises against the state for their rights, they just no, go and paint the map. No, I meant that with Modi, with the Modi government in particular, the, I meant that there's a new uh, element to it. You know, what I spoke about earlier was the Indian state in general having a paternalistic approach and a repressive approach and all of that. But I think that... Um, you know, in the in case of in the case of previous regimes, when the Congress was in power, you know, and so on, um, their approach was yes, they'll do repression, but they also want to maintain a, uh, at least a fig leaf of oh, we, there's Article 317, there's a constitution, some elections are being held, and uh, we are winning hearts and minds, and so on and so forth. Okay, so they had that compulsion at least to maintain a certain um, you know certain posture of dialogue and this and that, right? Even Vajpayee had it, and um, of course, Congress regimes had it. With this Modi regime, there is a new difference, and I think we have to understand the difference. I'm not trying to say that previous stuff was better or anything of the kind. I think we need to understand the difference if we want to contend with it successfully, right? So I, what I'm trying to say is that um, the, the way for the Modi regime, what they're doing is that uh, Kashmir is kind of really important to their politics in India. Previous governments didn't want you talking about Kashmir in India. Okay, they wanted silence. Modi wants everyone talking about Kashmir and clapping away and saying, God, Achatya is very good. You have, uh, you know, Hindu nationalist government has finally won, um, you know, it has, it has conquered a rebellious Muslim, Muslim, Muslim province, man. rebellious Muslim province. And then they want people to look around them, look at Muslims around them in India as well and say, ah, okay, you also they must be them. secretly Pakistani and we know what to do with you. We have the NRC for you and all of that, right? So it's part of a package there. So if you want to disrupt that, I feel it's more important than ever for even Indians invested in India's democracy, you know, to do uh, to actually disrupt the strategy. And finally, you know, I think you know the wages of ignoring Kashmir or being silent on Kashmir are really coming back to you know bite people in the you know haunt haunt you, haunt you because you know and now you have to contend with it. You have to. Because, Everybody, that's the only because, because because otherwise you know they uh, it's not going to what he is to what they what this regime is doing to Kashmir is uh, also going to you know you cannot as I Turn always say yeah you can't you can't you can't set fire to your neighbor's house and they think that the fire will be. come to your own house yeah mm-hmm. so I, I want uh, uh, since you have uh, worked on gender inequalities yes, yes, uh, your whole yeah. life I will uh, I won't actually ask you this. The, uh, the government and its mouthpieces, they have been saying that this abrogation of Article 370 is something actually liberating Muslim Indian women and as a women rights activist. Right. How do you see it and how much truth is there? <laughs> well, you know, uh, it's a joke really, but it's also uh, quite grim because I think that actually what they're saying is enabling more, um, you know, more sexual violence towards and more other kinds of violence towards uh, political violence towards Kashmiri women and I'll tell you how that's working because um, for one thing this is a lie you know uh, the fact is that you have uh, as I said you have a far far higher degree of education mm-hmm. and in Kashmir even for Kashmiri mm-hmm. girls and women um, even in rural Kashmir every time I visited rural Kashmir you're struck by the high uh, you know stand, uh, uh, because there's been free and compulsory education there yeah. uh, you know, historically and so it's a um, so actually these are you know these are very very assertive uh, women and girls and you know what they told us when we went there we asked them okay government is saying this what do you think and they were furious because they said you know we um, you know you are uh, we don't need our oppress- oppressors to come and liberate us and who is going to come and liberate and they would ask us they said you know don't you people have to fight patriarchies of your own 
Likewise, you know, we know what we are doing. And we are completely we are able to deal with it ourselves. But you cannot use this as a pretext to come and take this up and do this, right? Number one. Number two, they said, look at what these statements of the BJP leaders, you know, who are saying uh, Kashmiri, uh, the fair Kashmiri bribes, we'll go and get them and we will uh, marry them. Yeah, and, and that's translating into very real violence there. So during these night raids, the CRPF and army and whatnot are basically um, are basically coming in, uh, coming uh, coming up and telling people in their homes where where are your daughters? We want to marry them and all of that. And this is a clear threat of sexual violence, you know. And uh, so I think that again, you know, uh, You're just, just using it's, it's absolutely um, it's it's ridiculous to say that uh, this is all in the name of uh, liberating Kashmiri women and all of that. That's complete nonsense. And, uh, should be countered very strongly. Uh, uh, going back to you, uh, you have talked about NRC, which is essentially mm -hmm. National Register of Citizens. So I want to talk about that. And how uh, uh, I just want to put you because Kashmir is obviously an only Muslim majority state of India as, as of now. And I want to put this hate against Kashmiris and Muslims in perspective. How do you see the current Muslim hate in India? And do you think present India is severely homophobic? Um, uh, sorry, Islamophobic. Well, um, I wouldn't say that. I, I think that yes, Islamophobic politics is a, um, is a is a is certainly, of course, it is very is stronger than it ever was before, and so it's much more in the open. And people who had Islamophobic ideas are feeling much more emboldened to come out and act on them, come out and display them, and all of that. But having said that, I would be wary of uh, assuming. Um, as many people do based on what they see on social media and all of that, all of that everyone is really who's voted for Modi is actually do, done it because they're already Islamophobic yeah. and already fascist. I don't think that's quite true. You know, people vote for a lot of reasons. People vote also because they don't, you know, the uh, Modi and his side has five times the money that any opposition party, party has. Yeah. They don't see any other opposition or they think, you know, they think that, okay, in these very difficult times, maybe some particular welfare measure, maybe you know, somebody's got it in my village, maybe I also get it, and all of that. Okay, so I think that it's not so much that it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, of course, that there is a huge, um, you know, organized Islamophobia is much more bold and much more in your face right now. Yeah. Okay, so you're having all these uh, mob lynchings and so on happening, and then anybody who speaks out against mob lynching is being served this edition notice and so on as it happened just yesterday, right? So the point is it's also trying to deter ordinary people from just, you know, acting as human beings and standing up for their fellow human beings, you know. So there's also that happening because they're aware that, um, you know, if that is allowed to, you know, find a place, then, you know, your lynching agenda and so on won't get that much traction. Mm -hmm. So there's also an attempt to silence and scare off people. Yeah, uh, just, just to give listeners an idea that this is not a figment of her imagination. So I just wanted to quote the current Home Minister, who uh, I'm not happy to name, obviously. Mm -hmm. What he said in West Bengal, which is one of the most populous states, was that uh, they, essentially opposition, they're very fond of infiltrators, to expel inf infiltrators, NRC, which is National Register of States, and was bought. And they misled the people of Bengal by saying Bengalers will be true. Now, I want to assure all refugees living in Bengal, Hindu, Buddhist, and Sikh. They do not need to be afraid. We have bought the citizenship bill to grant each and every Hindu Bangladeshi a citizenship. No one will be left out. So this essentially was to say that we will only leave Muslims and probably Christians as well out of this new citizenship bill. Do you think this anti-Muslim hatred essentially, which is obviously maybe the center of this current government, was even imaginable that a home minister of India would utter such a statement yeah, just 10 I, years ago. I think it's completely open and you're absolutely right that this is a um, you know, the, this is a way to turn a what you know Modi and his uh, Lieutenant Shah and so on are treating India like a de facto Hindu Rashtra now Hindu nation now they want to turn it into a de jure one and you know citizenship amendment bill is one of the ways of doing that we are going to fundamentally change the definition of what it means to be an Indian citizen and turn you know Hindu first kind of policy there but I think that um, you know, what what is their strategy here? Essentially, this is a government that is ridden with terrible economic crisis right now, which is of their own making. So they need to, you know, so they're using Kashmir as one of the, you know, their political strategies here to, to divert attention and to say, look, we did this, no one else could do that. 
Likewise, they're making up this whole bogey of the Bangladesh. So Kashmir is a Pakistani bogey, okay? And uh, Bangla and Bang Bangladeshi infiltrator. These are loaded words. Even mm -hmm. where there are immigrants, even if there are undocumented immigrants, you know, immigrant is illegal, and you know, immigration happens both ways. Bangladesh's economy is doing particularly well now. I'm sure there are people who are heading over from the, the terrible tanking Indian economy to go over and work in Bangladesh also. And it's ridiculous to do this. But I think that you know, the whole thing is they don't really intend to deport. They told Bangladesh, for instance, Amit Shah, that don't worry, NRC shouldn't concern you. Why not? That means you're not all this deportation rhetoric is to basically make NRC another excuse for uh, demonizing, harassing, um, detaining, and uh, lynching. Of and Muslim, taking the attention Muslim out of the economy. minorities. Yes. Uh, yeah, and to make this whole thing so they will, uh, you know, try to outsource this violence, and then they make these detention camps and all of that yeah. outside awesome. Assam as well. Outside Assam as well. And so they're they're trying to create this mass statelessness. And and do you think that there's a similar pattern to as the, the, uh, Amit Shah was saying recently that we're going to impose Hindi on uh, South as well? Do you think they're just going to play this North versus South at some point of time in the future as a part of um, See, I think one of the things which uh, people in the South really connected with even when the Kashmir issue came yeah, up was that uh, apart from other things, you know, Kashmir's own very specific history and um, all of that, there's also a sense that, look, there's also a layer of, um, you know, there are different layers of federalism that the Indian arrangement had, right? 370 was one of those, mm -hmm. it was one of those, it was seen as one of those. Now, the point is that you, you also have other federal arrangements with other states. And so one of the things which we, did, we, we, we spoke to people about a lot was that, you know, if you speak Bengali or if you speak Tamil and you just say, I don't want uh, to accept Hindi as my state language or national language, um, then tomorrow, if they just come uh, come about and say, okay, we'll call uh, Bengal as um, you know, uh, we'll call Tamil Nadu as Hindi, Hindi, Hindi Pradesh, or we'll call Bengal something else. You know, so would you be all right with that? There would be an enormous uprising. Yeah. So you have to, um, you know, so to create empathy and understanding about what it is that everyone has something unique and special to them which they want to protect, right? And that Kashmiris um, had this feeling way before the accession happened. And the, uh, that was the primary political issue there yeah. about preserving Kashmir's uh, specific yeah. identity yeah. and specific. And therefore, uh, you know, the accession um, and all, all that was even this business about the 370 was temporary, right? The idea was that there was, you know, Jammu Kashmir uh, Constituent Assembly was to, you know, it was temporary in the sense that it was to be ratified by but or improved on they, by the they were its Constituent fine and Assembly. And now that there isn't that, now you can't just kind of pretend. So I think to make people understand also why that would mean so much to, yeah, try to run that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and thanks, uh, thanks for actually agreeing uh, to talk to us. And it's nice talking to you. Thank you all. Thank you. Why is Amrit? Oh, what did she do? For doing this for GMP TV. Yep, yep. You can tag them. No, I don't. Do, do you know that? Uh, yeah, I know because uh, from. Um, what? Have you seen? Have you announced it? I guess. Uh, so you didn't go live from the news, did you? So I guess. Uh, yeah, you should know. I'm so stupid. Yeah, I don't think we've done anything. <laughs>